see this movie tonight. I said, where, where is it? Is it Redbox? You know, we don't have TV. No, it's on Netflix. I, I don't have Netflix, Jay. I'll, I'll get you hooked up, Dad. So, Bernard and I watch it. I'm just, I feel like my heart's going to come out of my chest. It's getting bigger and bigger and pounding. And at the end, you know, I'm hysterical. I have no composure. And I just look at Bernadette and I say, I'm not going to put my fork into another piece of salmon, quote, or another piece of steak unless I go. Meaning if I don't go, I'm not eating. She goes, go. I said, you think it's of God? You know, Bernadette doesn't, you know, she kids around a lot, but she has an incredible connection with God. In many ways, a lot better than me. And she said, yes. Why would you be moved so much like this? And then she said, well, it's not like he put it in the National Geographic, but I think he's letting you know to go. Well, the next day she goes shopping and she comes home with the National Geographic and in it is Ethiopia. <laughs> and the plight of the Jewish refugees. Like, I need, I need some confirm. I'm, I'm your guy if you can, if, God, if you can confirm it, I'm your guy. And so God knows that. We made a pact a long time ago, me and the Lord. First got saved. I said, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm no bowling ball either. If you make it obvious, I'm your guy. That was the conversation. And ever since then, he's been very gracious to keep his end of the bargain. So um, I, the Lord told me to, to um, make sure Rusty, being of Jewish background, and a couple of other guys here have Jewish background, to make sure they see it. So the first one I text was Rusty, and I said, you know, you need to see this movie. I just saw it. I'm beside myself. And he said, um, I saw it. And then the Lord said, tell him you're going. I didn't want to tell anybody. And I said, I'm going. Now, Rusty, just to, so you know this, he's very protective of his family. He doesn't like to go away unless he has to. And so when I said, I'm going, he wrote back and he said, take me. And I thought, What? Like, this isn't, this isn't like, take you where? You want me to go take you to the park and put you on a swing? What, <laughs> what are we talking about here? And he was very emphatic. He said, I'm telling you, you've got to take me. And I was like, done. And uh, it's good because I like to take one person initially so there's a witness. So I come back, you know, because nobody trusts anybody anymore. So there has to be a witness of two or three. And, and I like that. I like somebody else to be there. Um... I'm sitting there at my table the next day, and I hear the Lord remind me of a guy's name, and his name is Kokeb Gadamu. I, I heard that name 20 years ago in 1999. He was one of the ones that went across Ethiopia. Three months it took. He had to hide in the day and travel at night in the jungle. His wife was almost gang raped. I mean, one time it was there clothes off, attackers on, so many miracles happened, and he made it to Sudan, to the refugee camp, and then he made it to Israel, not through the Red Sea diving, other, other means, before Operation Solomon, before planes were allowed to come in. And so I put out on the rabbi's forum, anybody know Kokeb Gadamu? And one rabbi responded. And so I had already called Kokeb before I put it out there, because to be honest with you, I trust the Lord before I trust anybody. The minute I called Kokeb, I said, Kokeb, my name is Greg Hirschberg. I'm a, I'm a Messianic rabbi. He goes, I know you. He said, I tried to get in touch with you five years ago. It just didn't happen. I said, I don't, I don't remember. I'm sorry. I said, I saw this movie, and I'm going to Ethiopia. Do you have any words of wisdom? And then he started to cry. And he said, I've been praying for 20 years somebody to go with me from the messianic movement to Ethiopia. He said, I'll meet you there. And at first I thought, wow, that's a really big statement. Maybe he just needs help. I don't care. Maybe he's fudging or exaggerating. But after meeting him and meeting people that knows him, no, he was praying 20 years. Billy, you can relate to that. How many years you prayed for a messianic synagogue in, in uh, Macon? Little did you know you were praying for a cult. <laughs> He 
Let me, let me give you guys, I think I owe it to you to give you a little brief history, uh, because Ethiopia is not like any other country in the world. Um, Beta Israel, Beta Israel, formerly called Falasha, and it's not a good term, don't ever call them Falasha. They're now known as the Jews of Ethiopia. The Beta Israel just means House of Israel. They descend from Menelik I, who was the son of Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. They remained faithful to Judaism even after the conversion of the powerful Ethiopian kingdom to Christianity in the 4th century AD, and thereafter they were persecuted. Totally, totally persecuted. Despite Ethiopian attempts to exterminate them, they tried to exterminate all the Jews in Ethiopia in the 15th and 16th centuries. The Beda Israel partly retained their independence until the 17th century when the emperor Sassanios utterly crushed them and confiscated their lands. These are, by the way, Jewish women in a synagogue. The Beda Israel have a Bible and a prayer book written in Ge'ez, which is an ancient Ethiopian language. They have no Talmudic law, hallelujah, if you ask me. But their preservation and adherence to the Jewish traditions is undeniable. This is them at a synagogue service, women, of course, in a separate area the way I was raised. They observe Shabbat. They practice circumcision. They have synagogue services led by Kohanim. They follow the dietary laws of Judaism, and they observe all the Levitical holidays. Judaism was so influential 3,000 years ago when Menelik came back after being trained in Israel that to this day, no one in the country eats pork. No one. Some of you are thinking, I don't want to go there, huh? <laughs> All the boys are circumcised on the eighth day, religious and otherwise, and all the churches are set up according to the pattern of the temple in the Old Testament. Now, I went there. I went to this place. I went to visit. It's the North American Conference on Ethiopian Jewelry. They have a few after-school programs, feeding programs, some other uh, uh, sports programs for the Jewish people there. Of course, they're being persecuted to this day. And I felt I was going there to really help them. And I'm going to help them, and we're going to help them. However, it took, a, it took a turn, a massive turn. And when I go, I'm like, Lord, whatever you want. I mean, even here, I'm like, whatever you want. Do what you want to do. And so we left Atlanta Monday evening, uh, the 14th, and we arrived at Addis Ababa. It's Ababa. It's not Ababa. Ababa, Ethiopia, Wednesday morning. It's a long trip, you know. You got to take a flight, then another flight for about 16 hours. Cokehead met us at the airport. Um, if you're looking at this picture, I'm to the left. I think it was interesting that we took the picture at Unity Park. I don't think Kokeb was aware of that, but God was. I felt like I knew him forever. I immediately test somebody with their sense of humor, because to me, sense of humor is crucial. If, if you ever meet people that are in the persecuted church, they're very goofy. And, and I could be very anointed one minute and goofy the next. And I think you have to come to the Lord as a child. If you take yourself too seriously, I meet pastors, they're so serious and they're so bright and they're so eloquent. I mean, they're going to get the glory. But when you're a fool, God gets the glory. Now, I said a fool, not foolish. Some, uh, some might be foolish in making bad decisions, and that's why you're in the situation you're in. That's not being a fool. A fool is saying, God, I don't know, but my eyes are on you. We got in a little car, and I said, they speak Amharic. So I said to the driver right away, I said, listen, my friend's Amharic is horrible, so I'll be translating for him. And Kokeb hysterically laughed, and I said, we're both Jewish. We're both Messianic. We're both ordained rabbis with the MJA. We both love God, and we both love people, and we both love to laugh. It was like I knew him forever, instantaneously. I felt closer to him than people I know for years and years and years. Thursday morning, the next morning, we were off to Gondar. I, I got really sick, man. I didn't realize, you know, I don't, I don't do all that well with altitude. I tried to ski out west a couple of times in Utah. Um, it's, this is the highest capital in the world. It's 8,000 feet above sea level. And so I didn't know that it was 8,000 feet above sea level. So when I got there, I couldn't breathe. I was like, I couldn't get a deep breath, so I thought... 
great, I'm dying in Ethiopia. <laughs> you know, you don't know what all the stuff I've had to deal with, you know, I, and, and then, I don't know, I got a bad case of diarrhea. I always do because I had C. diff colitis from uh, um, aspirating. That's when you swallow your own excrement, and ever since then, my system has been off. So, And I'm not talking about I had loose bowels. It was like, if, if, if you ever want to see Old Faithful, you could have just hung out with me. <laughs> It's very, it's very uncomfortable going to the bathroom every five minutes. You know, water, five minutes, five minutes, and, and there was nobody there to help. So I had this massive headache. I couldn't breathe. And, but I, I, I said, okay, God, maybe I blew it, you know. I'm willing to bow out, Lord. I make mistakes. Everybody does, but at least I try. And uh, the Lord said, use it. So I did. And um, we were off to Gondar. You see the line, Gondar, we had to fly there. Gondar is a very, very, very religious city. Um, the Christianity that they have there is Coptic, and Coptic Christianity is Roman Catholicism on steroids. Very, very rare that people are born again. Devout, they'll walk on their hands and knees to the church. But I met the traditional Jews born again, no. And I met a lot of Jews who were forced to convert to Coptic. They don't even know what they are but they're also not born again. It's, it's a mess. I met them all, but it's, it's a spiritual mess. As soon as we touched down in Gondar, we hit the ground running, and we went to the villages. We went to Shamo and Franz and Bira. Um, I haven't been to the villages in about three years, and um, I knew it was going to happen when I got there, you know. It's just um, poverty, poverty. Poverty. Um, th this is a house. Let me show you who lives there. And, and see, they're Coptic. They're Jews, but they were forced conversions. And the men aren't there, so you could picture about seven men also living in there. I'll tell you something. I'm not a dog lover. I know I'm a dog hater. If there's a cute little puppy, I might pet it. But I, you know, when people walk their dogs, you ever see people walk their dogs and they love their dogs more than people? And, and you're coming towards them, and they put that big smile, and then when you kind of circumvent the dog, they look at you like you deserve to die. <laughs> well, she didn't pet their dog. I'm not a dog lover, I'm not a dog hater, but I can tell you this, I wouldn't take a dog with mange and let him live in there. The smell, most of you couldn't handle the smell. If you smell somebody with a little bit of body odor, you know, you, you, you freak out, but this is overwhelming. It's sad. It's sad. And when I give reports, people say, well, Rabbi, I guess the thing is to be thankful. Well, what's your definition of thankful? Just going, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. The best way to be thankful is to help somebody who doesn't have. Uh, so it was, you know, I, I, I put on my game face. Not a falsher, but put on my game face. And then when I walked away from the village, I just wept ferociously so sad um we went to this we saw about a hundred kids and kokib had a bag and he took out pencils this is this these kids we went to visit a place i wanted to see what their wells look like because they don't even have clean drinking water none of them are healthy none of them not one that weighs about as much as she does and that's with well water. She'll put that on her back with that makeshift strap. She'll stay bent and walk 30 minutes up a mountain. You can't get your little daughters to clean their place sitting at the table. So, um, it's alarming. But when we went to this one village, Kokeb handed out pencils. And uh, you would think you were giving them like a 308 GTS Ferrari to a 16-year-old who didn't have a car. And let me tell you why this was significant, okay? Let me tell you how God works with me, and I'm sure he does with you too. It's very personal. My relationship with God is very personal. I don't share so much, you know, so much of what God tells me and what he shares with me personally. But my, my favorite story is a story about Mother Teresa. Because, you know, she was, she was in northern India. In northern India, there's wealth. And she was in a palace, and she was teaching rich Indian kids English as a second language. 
and she had the life of Riley. And one day she saw somebody outside begging, and it hit her, and she prayed. And God said, no, you, Teresa, you. And she got the call, and she left the palace, and she lived in a makeshift tent in the slum. And somebody from Life magazine heard all about her and what she was doing. It was a big story. And he came all the way to India to interview her. And he chased her around, and she wanted no part. And finally he said, Teresa, it could help you, which eventually it did, just like this camera helps us. Without it, we wouldn't have all the people listening. We couldn't do what we do, no offense, with just you guys. Couldn't happen. So um, she turns to him and says, you came all this way to interview me? And he said, yes, Teresa, yes. And she said, I'm a pencil in the hand of God. So sad that you came 9,000 miles to interview a pencil. So as soon as Kokeb gave the pencils, God whispered in my ear, you're a pencil in my hand, Greg. Right? Right. So what we want to do is we want to put wells. You know, whenever I take somebody there, no offense, they think about a kid going to college, you know, because we're American. They need water. They need um, maybe an antibiotic so they don't die from a little infection. They need the dignity of maybe having a school. What they'll do with it, in, in Africa, in Kenya, our school is doing well. Some of those kids are going to college. But you gotta, you got to crawl before you walk and before you run. And if you give somebody a million dollars, you'll corrupt them. Just like when they gave the Holocaust survivors a Thanksgiving meal, their stomachs exploded. There's a wisdom in this. I've, I, this isn't my first rodeo. You've got to trust me. But some of these villages, so what I would like to do um, with your help is put in maybe five wells in five different villages. There's a village called Tak Genyet, Shamo, Bira, Mota, and in Franz in the Gojam district. Um, I have a vision, and it's Kokeb's vision as well, to buy a track of land. There's persecuted families. If somebody has a stroke in the area, they say, well, it was the evil eye of the Jew, and they persecute him, if not kill him. So I want to move about 100 families on this land, and I would like to have agriculture for them so they can raise their food, some cows, of course, a school, and some basic medical. Um, the other thing that happened that was tremendous, this is um, what we want to do. This is a school, you know, wherever you go, there's wealthy people. And this is a private school, but I, and the kids are beautiful, and they're well-groomed, and they're, they're healthy, and that's what I want to see in some of the villages. Um, the other thing that happened that was amazing is we, we planted two congregations in three days, which is unheard of. Um, can anyone say CBY Ethiopia? I can. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, Kokeb cannot run these because Kokeb is running a congregation in Jerusalem that I'm going to visit when I go in February. I want to help him move from Jerusalem. I want to help him in his cause um, in these last days evangelism for the Jewish people because I think he can get to the people. So I want him to focus on that. Um, Kokeb, within two days, said, I want to come and do ministry. And um, amazing guy. Um, I've been so blessed to meet the excellent in the earth. So blessed. Um, there was so much religious confusion. We were at this well in this village, and this guy drives by, and he's looking, and he starts walking towards us, and I said, you know this guy? You know it's crazy, too? People, like, have guns, and I don't even care, but I'm more concerned walking in Macon. It's crazy when the Lord has you exactly in the palm and the center of his hand, you have no fear. Not because you're a tough guy, none. But I said, do you know this guy? And he said, oh, yeah. I said, what do you know him from? I mean, he knew so many people because he grew up in Gondar. And he has a program from Israel that goes into Ethiopia once a week. You know, with the menorah and Shabbat Shalom, he's trying to get to people. It's beautiful. Um, you have a tissue. I'm going to need a tissue. I know it. I know where this is going. Um,
how do, you, how do you know this guy? He said, I baptized him 30 years ago in the Sudan refugee camp. The minute he came up, I felt so much of the Lord on him. I said to Kokeb, I said, when we go to lunch, I would like him to come. And um, he came. His name is Desalin. And um, this is him and his wife. And he was so beautiful. I mean, I could feel his beauty, his legitimate humility. Not, I don't like false humility. I'd rather have somebody arrogant than falsely humble. Arrogant I could deal with. Falsely humble you can't cure because it's insidious arrogance. And I told him, I said, this is going to sound crazy. He has a prayer group that prays for Israel. He probably loves Israel and the Jewish people. He goes, he is. He's a Jew. I said, what do you do now? He goes, well, actually, I have a decent job. I work with an NGO, but I, I don't feel called to that. I said, we went back and forth, and then he said, I had a dream about you 10 years ago that you came to Ethiopia and you asked me to start a congregation. And he's got a lot of prophetic gifting because he's pure. He is a guy who's righteous and walks with God. No question about it. And so these are, they're already up and running. These are his two congregations. Um, that's, um, that's people when they go to pray in the congregation. That's where they go. They're praying for Israel, interceding. Um, one is in Gondar, and the other one is 70 miles south in Bajadar. And um, it's amazing. I mean, it usually takes us a little while to plan congregations, but... I guess God's got us on the fast track. Um, Kokeb is another Samuel. Kokeb is another Stephen. Kokeb is another Arnie that the Lord blessed me with. He will head up all our Ethiopian ministries. He's, as I said, currently leads a congregation with an outreach to Ethiopian Jews in the land of Israel. Um, my dear friend, Pastor Chuck Williams, texted me and he said, I know the trip was anointed, but he said, quote, what was the best part of the trip? I wrote back to him. I said, the answer's easy. The best part of the trip was feeling just like Yeshua. When I'm there, when I go to these places, guys, I don't think about Bernadette and the kids, and not because I don't love them. They're, they're totally non-existent. You guys are non-existent. I am so free to just pour out unconditional love it feels amazing to feel just like Yeshua. Just amazing. I did something with um, Kokeb when I was leaving that I've been doing every trip I go. And I, uh, I started it because I was leaving Chepes, Argentina about 26 years ago. And it was very poor. I mean, girls were selling their bodies for 50 cents. It's a, a really rough place that the people in Buenos Aires don't even have anything to do with it. They have nothing good to say about them, like it's their fault. And um, I had to drive through this mountain range with this pastor. And, uh, you know, his car was so beat up, you know, like 400,000 miles and no vents. He had stuff shoved in the vents. And it was very cold. And the night before, what happens is when you finish preaching, people line up for hours, just hours. I was there till like 3 in the morning, 2.33. And they each come by and they give you something. One might give you their tie. It's the only tie they have. Somebody might give you their New Testament. And you have to take it. You have to take it. And so you're weeping as they're giving and giving. And so when this guy, we got to the airport. Um, he drops me off. And he only has this one sweater. And he starts removing it. I said, stop, man. I can't take it anymore. He says, Rabbi Greg, you have to take it. Because if you take it, you'll never forget me. And it's 26 years later, and I haven't forgotten him. So whenever I go to these places, I bring my favorite things. And I give it to the guy. So I was giving it to Kokeb. I said, look, it's not a big deal, but this is my favorite shirt. My absolute favorite. 
This, this is my favorite t-shirt. This is my favorite pair of pants. My absolute favorite. And I don't have much clothes. I mean, I just depleted my wardrobe by 50%. <laughs> but Kokeb wrote to me the next day and he said, when you gave me your clothes, you really touched my heart. You're a shepherd and a father. You'll always be in my heart, brother. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank God for prompting my son to get me to watch the movie, The Red Sea Diving Resort. Two, I'd like to thank the good people of Beth Yeshua, you guys that are here and you guys that are not here, for sending me out, paving my way in prayer. I couldn't have done it without that. I'd like to thank Rusty for being a good traveling companion. He's very, very low maintenance. We had a funny moment. Uh, we, we, you know, Kokeb was just, you know, I wanted to make him laugh. He loves to laugh. We got off this little plane and going darn, I made the flight attendants come over and I was waving. I wanted to feel like the prime minister of Ethiopia and they called me prime minister. They said, have a good day, prime minister. And everybody's, everybody's looking. But um, at one point, there was a lot of people, I don't know why, but they, they thought I looked like Bruce Willis. So people were like... <laughs> In the Capitol, people are hitting, and somebody wanted to ask me. So Rusty goes, everybody thinks you're Bruce Willis. They think you're a movie star. And then Rusty goes, I bet they think I'm a star, too. And I said, who? And he goes, I bet they think I'm Weird Al Yankovic. <laughs> better, better than being just Weird Al. I had a friend, Weird Al. You don't want to be him. And lastly, um, I'd like to thank God, I really would, for allowing me to be one of his pencils that he chooses to write with. It's an honor. It's an honor. And over the next couple of weeks, I, I want to encourage you to be one of his pencils. You know, in America, we think big. Even believers, they think big. How many people came to the meeting? How many people got saved? How much money do you make? World Series, world champion. Don't despise small beginnings. Whatever God tells you to do, in his eyes, it's big. Let's stand together. picture. I just think it's kind of uncanny that in 1979, some Jewish guy was trying to hug on some Ethiopian Jews, and 40 years later, yeah. God is so much more than we know or can fathom and understand. You just can't understand them. I know some people are very spiritually deep. Your best bet is to get with him, hear what he has to say, and then do it. Nothing more, nothing less. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua. Yevarecha Adonai, v'yishmerecha, Adonai ponovelecha. Vehunecha Yesa Adonai Ponovelecha Yasem Lecha Shalom Love you guys. Shabbat Shalom.